Welcome to Australian Hiker, your online hiking resource. We're your hosts, Tim and Jill Savage. This is episode 140 of the Australian Hiker podcast. In today's episode, we catch up with Annie Connor, who is a keen Canberra-based hiker and has spent over 20 years hiking throughout Australia, New Zealand and overseas, including tracks such as Larapenta Trail and the Annapurna Base Camp. Towards the end of 2019, Annie completed the Everest Base Camp track, and as this track sits on many people's bucket lists, we wanted to catch up with Annie to find out more about her experience. We hope you enjoy. Okay, so Annie, thank you for taking the time to talk with Australian Hiker about this well-known trip. No, you're welcome. All right, so we, before we talk about your Everest base camp trip, tell us a bit about your hiking background. Okay, I've been hiking for well over 20 years now and started to get more seriously into it when my sons were quite young. I used to put them into YMCA camp for a week during school holidays and go off to Wentworth Falls in the Blue Mountains and hike around the Gross Valley. It soon became quite addictive and I really liked that it's an activity that can be done in a group or with just one other person or even solo. I did a lot of um, group sport activities like netball and basketball and was quite frustrated having to rely on other team members to turn up. So what I like about hiking is you don't need to wait for anyone else. You can just go off by yourself. No, that's that's pretty pretty uh, pretty uh, typical. I think people like to get away from things. So, what uh, what sort of trips have you done previously to the Everest Base Camp trip? Okay, I joined the Canberra Bushwalking Club early in the piece just to gain some more skills and to test my limits within the group environment. So, the first multi day trek I did with a friend was the Great Ocean Walk in Victoria. It was a five day walk. Um, after that, I did the Larin, the Larapinta trek as a volunteer. Um, I did that as a volunteer with Trek Larapenta because I couldn't get anyone to come on that hike with me and doing it solo wasn't really an option at the time. I happened to save their homepage as a favourite and every day I'd look at it at lunchtime and try and visualise myself being there and on one particular happy day up popped this little notice that said volunteers needed for track maintenance so I was quickly on the blower. All I needed to do then was get myself to and from Alice Springs and did the entire Larapinta trek with Trek Larapinta and the Northern Territory Rangers. So they fed us well, looked after us, and um, it was kind of like a free tour. That, that works well. Yeah. Okay, and I believe you've done some previous stuff in the Himalayas as well? Yeah, I sort of started off prior to the Himalayas um, just testing some skills in New Zealand, given it's a alpine environment as well. I didn't do any alpine treks there, but I done the Heafy track, did the Abel Tasman and the Queen Charlotte track twice as, as solo hikes and just getting into the rhythm of walk, sleep, walk, sleep, walk, sleep and enjoying that experience. So in November 2017, I decided to go to Nepal and did the Annapurna Base Camp trek with Intrepid Tours. I didn't have a friend with me on that trek. It was just wholly and solely myself joining up with the Intrepid Tour group. <laughs> now let's talk about your Everest Base Camp trip. What made you decide to do the Everest Base Camp? Well, my sister-in-law and I, her name's Helen, we travel the world together quite a lot. We've been around Southeast Asia, we've been to India and Africa and Mexico and travel very, very well together and we hike very well together. Um, in her family, it had always been a great accomplishment if anyone got to Everest Base Camp, uh, no one in her family had. Um, and so she put it forward to me. I was very reluctant. I will admit right from the get-go I wasn't keen. I had this image in my head that it was the world's biggest, like highest rubbish dump and it was overcrowded with trekkers and it wasn't really the style that I was into. We had a discussion about it. I convinced her that if we put the Gokyo Lakes as part of our trek that I would be really keen on going, so we agreed that that would be a good thing to do. So it went from a 10-day trip to a 19-day trip with a 16-day track. Okay, so uh, the uh, actual Everest Base Camp track itself, how many days is that if you, if you had just had have done that? I think that's a 10-day track, but we added the others, so it was became a 16-day hike. Okay. 
Um, so really the, the reason for you doing this was, you know, there was obviously a bit of family history there with, uh, with your saying your sister-in-law. Yes, that's right. Um, um, and, and I must admit, I, I'm probably a bit the same as you that, um, doing high altitude stuff, I've done that sort of stuff in Bhutan. Um, but I, I don't know, it's just something very different. I'm, I'm probably a bit like you that it probably wasn't on my list. It just had almost ended up a bit by, by mistake that we ended up doing Bhutan. Well, I did... Annapurna Base Camp, because um, for me, Nepal's always been like the hiking mecca. A lot of people I know who've hiked have talked about going there. I was also advised by a gentleman that I met on the Larapinta Trail, Hello Vivdor, that Nepal is a place you you can't go to once. So I did have a desire to go back there, but I was more looking at doing the Mustang Valley or maybe the Langtang Valley trek. Yep. Um, but Helen was quite interested and quite determined to do Everest Base Camp, so that's where we went. All right. Now, I'm assuming you did this as an organised trip. Um, how did you decide who to go with? It wasn't a decision that was hard for us. We've done many t- trips around the world with Intrepid Tour. They're an Australian-based company and they're a very small group tour, like the most that we've ever had on a tour is 12 people. As it turned out, on this particular trek, we had nine. We've travelled Southeast Asia, Mexico. We did a month overland in Africa with Intrepid where we camped every night. We find they've got responsible tourism. They look after the locals. They use local guides. They treat their porters really well, um, are very aware of the weight limits that they carry. They, um, they're just the classic leave-no-trace tour group. And the other main thing was that other groups that we looked at touring with stay in eco tents but we wanted to stay in, in the nepalese tea houses and have a more traditional experience with the locals all right and i'll put the uh, the link to that trip uh with intrepid travel in the, in our show notes and they have got a good reputation so uh, i think uh, but, uh, it, uh, you're not alone in saying that uh, they provide a good service okay so what training and preparation did you do prior to the trip Okay, well, hiking is pretty much something I do every day. I'm lucky enough to have a, a little mountain behind me called Mount Jerobombra. It's more like a little hill, but I walk up there every day after work with my dog. It's a nice break between work and then the home activities. What we did, um, we Helen lives at a little coastal village called Browley, so she lives basically at sea level and she only has one little tiny hill near her house. So we started a routine of every weekend we'd go hiking and camping. So we'd do one weekend in Canberra where we had really good access to Namaji National Park and with the Aurora Valley and those areas plus Tidbinbilla Nature Reserve. And at the coast we had really great access to Durris Mountain, Gulaga that also have really good access to camping grounds. So we were getting used to walk, sleep, walk um, and going up hills and over and back again. Did you do any other preparation or any other training apart from um, uh, hiking or you know, do any gym-based or weight-based? Uh, no, we didn't so? do any of that. Helen, um, I will say that in a lot of trip notes that you see, there's nothing about the amount of stairs that are in Nepal. So a lot of people do training up and down hills. My advice is seriously do stair work. It's really different to walking up and down hills and some of the people on the trek kind of struggled with that. Um, in mind. I'd had previous experience in Annapurna, so I was aware of that. And there's lots of stairs in the building where I work. Helen actually doesn't have stairs, but she was doing step ups and down on her coffee table. And apart from that, it was just carrying our packs with us, things that we were going to use on the trek, testing out our um, layering system of clothing, our sleeping bags in cold camera winters. And even down to testing out, I'm not a lover of chocolate, so for me, eating Snickers bars was one of the hardest things I had to do in Nepal. But we tested out things like what goo and those gel-based proteins, if they were going to be any good, as as it turned out they were, and we took some with us. Yeah, I must admit, I, I went through and did a test of all the, the available ones on the market, and some were better than others, but they, if you want a, a bit of a hit, hit of energy very quickly, they're a good way about it. Yeah, we found they worked really well. Now you mentioned you 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 were going hiking and uh, and training with your pack. What were you expect to actually carry? I mean, you were saying um, uh, you were staying in uh, in tea houses, I believe. Mm. Yep. So we only had to carry day packs. With basically, you're carrying your water, your snacks, raincoat, um, down jacket, those kind of things, um, and you of course your camera and gloves, extra kind of stuff, waterproof gear. 
we had porters that would carry 10 kilos of stuff for us. So they would take your other clothing, your sleeping bag liner, whatever else it was that you took with you. But during the day, you're basically just carrying a, a day pack with just basically snacks and just layering clothing systems. What um, uh, what sort of what was the rough sort of weight of your pack that you were carrying? Do you remember? Helen and I travel incredibly light. Like we probably were lucky to have four or five kilos in our day pack. Okay, that's pretty good. Yeah. Now the um, were were the Sherpas carrying? I'm, I'm assuming they were probably carrying additional gear. But I mean, what what were there were there any pack animals at all, or was all people power? No, we were all people power, and they would um, load up our stuff during the day. They carried two people's packs together along with their own so they're probably carrying about 26 kilos i would imagine and they'd go off ahead early in the morning and then when we get to the tea house our bags would be outside of our room ready for us to access our warm clothes okay um so this is the everest base camp and it's the as you say it's the it's the the really the 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 Stop off point or starting point for people doing uh, the the summit to Everest. Everyone sort of goes through the base camp. Now the altitude is is approximately five thousand three hundred and sixty meters. How much of a concern was that to you? you? You know, you said you'd been through to Annapurna before, but um, was it a concern, or had Helen been to that altitude before? Uh, it wasn't a great concern. I when I did the Annapurna trek, Helen was doing the Inca Trail. So she went flew to Cusco and did you know the trek to Machu Picchu, which is an altitude trek as well. We both um, were perfectly okay on those trips. We um, were quite aware that we were going significantly higher than what we'd been before, so it was in our mind, but it wasn't like high concern for us. Um, when we read the intrepid trip notes, it kind of highlighted that the further up in altitude you got, that once you got into the tea house, you'd have a rest and then you'd go and do an acclimatization hike. Sometimes you really not want to do it because you just like want to stay warm, but you'd push yourself out and it'd be like sometimes an hour and a half, two hours acclimatization, walking up higher and sleeping low. They also um, were really good at keeping track of if people had any altitude sickness symptoms. They would had a table each day and you had to write morning and night how you were feeling. They had the little readers on your finger that would take your oxygen saturation levels. So they were quite on it and I think a lot of the days were shorter than some people would have liked because they were really good at acclimatizing you yeah I think and I think that's often the case I mean quite often with, with when you're doing long altitude hikes you, you or, or high altitude hikes you're not necessarily doing 20 or 30 kilometers in a day but really you, you can't in most cases do that because of the altitude Correct, yeah. So um, take a good book if you want to, but we found that it was really just good enough talking to the other people in the tea houses and, you know, they're from other parts of the world and you've got other people, you know, that you're walking with on your tour. So it wasn't really a great concern to have some downtime in the afternoons. It was quite welcome. So we'll start looking at the trip more specifically. So um, first off, we'll start with what what was a typical day? What time did you get up? What time did you start walking and and on average, what time did you finish? Okay, well, I'll just go back to the first day when we left Kathmandu um, to that fab- fabulous flight to Lukla. We had a really early start because the airport at Kathmandu is having one of the runways upgraded, so we had a 4 a.m. start and a five-hour trip in a minibus to uh, another little airport in a place called Ramachap. And then so we only had a 20-minute flight to Lukla, which was – I thought it was incredibly exciting. Um, I didn't find it fearful at all. Maybe it was just so good that we were out of the minivan after five hours and then we're finally getting to go to where we were going. So it was a really long day the first day because once we got to Lukla, it was around about a seven-hour trek up to Namchi Bazaar and that is a lot of up and up and up. And I don't think you realise how much up you're doing until you're on your way back down and you're going back down, down, and you think, how did we ever climb up there but a typical day you're like you sort of early in the morning up around about 6 30 breakfast in the tea house and then you'd sort of get all your pack together and you'd meet outside an hour later and off you'd go you have um quite a few stops along the way so you can look at the scenery because you have to really concentrate most of the time when you're trekking in nepal the ground's really uneven everywhere you go it's not like smooth paths there's really loose gravel sometimes you feel like you're walking on marbles other times you're walking like on like really dry riverbeds and the really big boulders so you're constantly looking 
at where your feet are going. So it's, it's quite mentally exhausting as well as physically being in that concentration mode all the time. So after lunch, you know, stop for lunch and it's amazing how much you can eat, noodles or rice and, and then you go off again for a couple of hours in the afternoon. You get into your tea house, have a cup of tea, have a bit of a break and then you do your acclimatisation trek before dinner. Okay. So um, apart from the first day, which sounds like it was a, a nice long sort of day, yeah. Um, you know, what, what would be the usual, uh, and I, I know this is going to vary, but what would be the usual get up and, and leave times and what would you typically, what, what time would you usually finish at the end of the day? Uh, typically, you know, getting up around 6.37 and, and, and the day would kind of like by the time you've done an acclimatisation hike, as you got high altitude, you're probably back in, in camp by four. Yeah, most days were pretty much spread out that kind of length. Some days you're walking seven hours. Other days, you know, on the 16-day trek might only be four or five, but the average day would be six to seven hours, just, you know, constant walking. And were you uh, walking as a, as a group of nine plus uh, staff or were you sort yeah, we of had, out? Yeah, the group of nine and we had um, the main leader of the, tre- of the trek with two other porters with us so you'd have the one guy at the front one at the back and you know and, and one in the middle and you'd because we you know as a group would often spread out I prefer to walk just with Helen or so a lot of the time by myself and but you're still connected to the group yeah so I, I must admit I think that's that's pretty typical of a lot, a lot of group walks is mm-hmm. as long as you're walking at least the the minimum sort of pace you know, you'll get people who walk quite fast uh, others, yeah. others will be a bit more medium, and others will be quite, quite slow. So. Yeah. Well, Helen and I had um, had done a lot of practice on our lead up to Nepal. I'm a, notoriously a quick walker, um, and I had to, funnily enough, learn how to walk slow. Yeah. And it's quite a different thing to do, and it's quite a hard thing to do. So I practiced a lot of that walking slower on the um, training trek. So when we got to Nepal, Helen would go in front, and I would just go lock in behind her because she would keep the pace that. That we needed to keep, and if I did go around her, she'd go. You're going really quick again. I go. Oh, that's right. So, but there were different um, styles of walking and different paces. We had one young lady who was an asthmatic, and she was. Um, so, if anyone's got health issues and they're quite concerned, she did very well and got to base camp with us. She just walked a bit slower, and they were really good at making sure that whoever got into the rest stop last had enough time before they headed off again. So in this case here, uh, you combined uh, the Everest Base Camp trip with a trip to... Gokyo Lakes. Gokyo Lakes. Yeah. So you were saying that um, Gokyo Lakes was your first trip out. Uh, and Correct. That was, a, that was a six-day trip out and back? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And what's so good about Gokyo Lakes? Oh, what's not good about Gokyo Lakes, the scenery is absolutely spectacular. The colour of the lakes is like this aqua blue. There's glaciers all around. You have the most stunning mountain views on the way to Gokyo Lakes. You're looking at Abadablam, Lotsi, all those big, big mountains on the way there. And to me, it was one of the highlights of the tour. I don't think I would have had such a good time if I hadn't have gone to Gokyo Lakes first. And a lot of people on our tour said it was a highlight. And was it, was everyone on the trip that you were on doing both the lakes and the yes, that, that was the combined trip. Yeah, okay, yeah. Um, so it sounds like there's it's a. I must admit, I, as I said, I, I have, I'm a bit the same as you. I have this perception of that being a bit of a bit of a traffic jam with all these people there. So going off to somewhere a bit different and a bit more scenic is probably not a bad way to do it. Well, there were a lot less people on the track to Gokyo than there was once we joined on to the Everest Base Camp track. But the good thing about going to Gokyo Lakes is you get to go up to Gokyo Re, which we went up to. Gokyo Re is what it is five thousand three hundred and fifty-seven meters. Okay, so it's almost the the same sort of altitude as the yeah, base camp. it is. So you get really if you make it there and you're acclimatized there, you drop back down, and then you sort of gain altitude again, so a bit more confident. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I mean, as an overall thing for the trip, were you? Um, um, was you know was there a lot of ascents during the day, or were you finding some days you're ascending and other days you were sort of staying flat? Or there's no such thing as flat in Nepal. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Tim. <laughs> what do they say? Nepali flat, a little bit up, a little bit down. But um, I don't know. It's hard. To, it's hard to say. A lot of days you're going up, but there were some pretty incredible descents as well. So once we left Gokyo and we we're heading back to join the 
um, Everest Base Camp main track, main track. It's, it's really quite disheartening that you're losing all the altitude that you've worked really hard to gain, knowing full well that you're going to have to gain it again. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. Now, I suppose that takes us on to a, a different direction. You know, you're mentioning all these hills. Um, let's talk about equipment. Uh, were you using tracking poles at all? Yeah, we were, and I would not recommend going there without them. It's the only time I actually do use them. I'm, I'm, I um, I find that in places like that where the ground is so uneven that they're fantastic stability. They take so much pressure off your knees, as we all know, but the fact you've got three points of contact with the ground at all times Absolutely highly necessary because, like I was saying, the ground is really uneven. Even the um, stone stairs up and down are really uneven. You've got yaks going past. You've got donkeys going past. You know, I almost got pushed into the side of the hill with one of the yaks and kind of called out to the guide, you know, like, hold me now, which became a bit of a a joke for my sister-in-law on the track that I'd yelled that out, you know. Um, But... Yeah, just that three, like you just feel far more secure. Some of the parts of the trail are very close to the cliff edge, like not precariously close, but close enough that if you had a fear of heights, you might be a bit disconcerted. But trekking poles give you that extra little bit of confidence in those areas as well. Do you have much problems with your knees going downhill or is it is it more stability you're using them for? More stability for me, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So tracking poles are definite, and I must admit, I uh, anything any time uh, I go anywhere near altitude, I definitely take them. And, and but for me, it's it's my knees coming downhill, okay. the compression that's the real issue. Yeah. Um, what other key pieces of gear did you take with you? So I mean, you needed your own sleeping bag. No, we actually tested out our sleeping bags and and all that kind of gear. We had a really wild night out in the Royal Valley out in Amagi in the dead of Canberra winter, which is a great place to test your gear. Yep. So we realised that our sleeping bags weren't that crash hot. So the next morning we got up, raced into Canberra, into Paddy Palin, bought the Cedar Summit Extreme Liner, went back out and camped again and found they made a big difference. But we just decided to hire the sleeping bags in Kathmandu. We'd done – oh, Helen is very good at researching. So she found a place that was well recommended on TripAdvisor – and the sleeping bags we hired cost us, I think, $32 for the whole time we were there. And they were perfect. We were so warm. They were really good. Yeah. Uh, and what sort of uh, – what were the nighttime temperatures like there? What was the what was the range from daytime to nighttime? Oh, look, I think it got down to like minus 10, things like that overnight. But, you know, tea houses are basically plywood. They're not heated, so you feel the cold. And because you're really tired as well because you've been walking all day – I think you feel the cold even more. So, yeah, my advice is don't underestimate the cold. Yeah, I think good sleeping bags definitely a, a yeah. good one there. Now, was the uh, the clothing you were wearing, were you wearing just standard hiking pants or were you wearing mountaineering style pants? No, we just wore basically like our, our usual everyday hiking gear. Like we took merino like tights with us and we took fleece tights. Most of the time up until we got to fairly high altitude, we were just like walking in normal you know, like Kathmandu or Macpac hiking pants. we both lovers of merino, so we'd already worked out our layering system for merino tops and, you know, fleece and down jackets and those kind of things. But basically I didn't think you need any extra gear. Okay. Um, and was there uh, any other particular piece of gear that's sort of slightly out of the ordinary or it's pretty much stock standard in most cases? Stock standard, yeah, yeah, stock standard gear. Okay. The only thing I wish that I'd taken, and it was like all of our gear worked really well, better gloves. Like we had, both of us have merino glove liners. I had possum merino liners and a really good pair of North Face gloves. But on base camp day, my fingers were just stinging, like completely really, really cold and stinging. Up until that day, they were fine, but that would be the thing I would really recommend, like the best gloves you can get. I think that's probably that's probably one of the rare things, you know, unless you're used to hiking in snow conditions. Most hikers probably don't own a, a fairly decent pair of gloves. They'll have the basic set of gloves to keep them warm in most yeah. conditions. Well, our feet were really warm. We had no issues with our socks. We had merino socks and all that kind of stuff. They were fine. But, yeah, the gloves, like we had our beanies were good. We had like those fleece headbands and then with a beanie over the top and you got your down hood on your jacket and that. But, yeah, gloves. And, and everyone was wearing boots, I'm assuming, or were people wearing? No, a lot of people were wearing just like the normal, like just hiking shoe. Yep. That, you know, and they didn't seem to have any problems with those. I still, I, I wear boots when I do things like that. But um, a lot of people just had the normal straight hiking shoe. All right, no, that's good. 
Okay, so you get to Everest Base Camp. Now, when what? how far into the trip do you get to Everest Base, base Camp? What, uh, what pretty much, it? well, because we did like a 16-day trek. I think it was only four days um, from the end that we were at Base Camp because we'd gone up to Gokyo and then all the way back through. So once you get to Everest Base Camp, it's a pretty quick roll back down the hills to, to Kathmandu. Now, were you? Um, did you actually stay at Everest Base Camp for a night or did you... You virtually get there. No, we stayed at Gorak Shep, which is not far from Everest Base Camp, and then you sort of wake up in the morning and you trek to Gorak Shep. Uh, sorry, trek to Base Camp from there and back. Yeah. And, and Gorak Shep is, is is a lower altitude, is it, or not much lower? Not much lower at all. Yeah, but it get, but it gets you away from the crowds. Ah, oh, it's pretty crowded at Gorak Shep too, because that's where everyone stays before they go to to Base Camp. Yeah. Uh, and what did you think of base camp when you got there? Oh, look, you know, I was completely blown away by the whole thing. It was really exhilarating to actually stand there and realise that it wasn't the world's highest rubbish tip at all, that they've done a very good job of cleaning up through there. Um, and it's such a vast area that there is a lot of room for a lot of people to be there and everyone's just exhilarated. It's a really emotional thing when you've walked for so long to get to somewhere and you're finally standing there looking at it. You know, I, I've been fascinated with that area for a very long time and, like, early explorers and, and really adventurous people. I read Douglas Moss and the Accursed Land every year, but I'm very, you know, read lots of mountaineering stories, so I'd actually be looking at the Kumbu Icefall. And for some people, base camp is just the start of their adventure, where for us it's kind of like the end and the pinnacle. For a lot of people, it's the beginning I remember that, uh, and I don't know if it's still being offered, one of the tracking companies was uh, promoting a thing called the the Annapurna Circuit and it was actually a six-month track through the Himalayas. Uh, and it was, you know, it is six months, so that's pretty serious time being that, sitting there. Is that the Great Himalayan Trail? It may well be. It, it, I think it was, um, it was only a few years ago I noticed this and I thought, you know, the six months, that's a long time. I think World Expeditions do a Great yeah, Himalayan Trail. That's the one. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. So, and you go through all the high passes. So if you yeah if you if you've got the time and the inclination and uh, to spend six months in that area, it's probably not a bad way to do it. That's it. Okay, so you got up to base camp, had a look around, then you came back down to was it Gorik Gor- Gor- Shep, Gor- Shep, Shep yes, uh, and then back down to Lukla. Uh, but you were saying that um, you did a slightly different direction to get back to that area. Yeah, that's correct. We went past one of the monasteries on the way back, and that's not a bad way to do it. Actually, it's. Um, uh, with a lot of tracks, you'll often go out and back on the same trail, and while you see different things, it's nice to go almost on a circuit type. Well, we actually, on the way back down, we uh, stopped oh, in a place called Parici, and it was Helen's birthday, and Intrepid had been really good at organising a birthday cake to be made by the tea house operators for Helen's birthday when we got back there. It was really sweet that they had done that, and it had a lovely little typo on the cake as well, so that made it even more <laughs> even more quaint. That's not that's doing pretty well. Okay, so you end up back finishing the trip just on around about uh, was it sixteen days you were saying? Yes, yeah, it was a nineteen day tour, but sixteen day trek. So yeah, we ended up back there on day eighteen, and we had a, a free day in Kathmandu at the end. All right, so what went as expected on this trip, and what curveballs did it throw at you? Well, basically everything went as expected because in, in, like with Intrepid, they've just got everything so logistically sorted and they do the trek, like they have trips leaving every week throughout the um, season. So they've got everything down to a really fine art. Um, nothing sort of happened that was out of the ordinary that I can recall. The only thing that was different was the flight and, and the, um, the five hours in the bus trip, but that was well spe- uh, spelt out in the trip notes that that could occur. And Intrepid had advised us prior to us going to Kathmandu via email that that was going to happen. So there wasn't really anything that didn't work out the way that it should. Okay, and you and you were, you and you had obviously done uh, Annapurna before, and your your sister in law had spent time in South America. So you you were happy with your fitness over the duration of the trip? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and what about um, now? What were the highlights of the trip? Uh, what were the what were the two things that really stood out? Okay, well, for me, getting to the top of Gokyo Re and standing up there at at five thousand three hundred fifty seven meters that I got there with two feet and a half feet, and when you're standing up there on one side, you're looking down over the most amazing glacier, the um, what's it called, the N- oh, Nzumpo Glacier. Very hard to pronounce some of those words. 
And on the right-hand side, I'm looking over Gokyo Lake. Directly in front of me, I'm looking at Mount Everest, Lhotse, Cho'o'u and Makalu, all 8,000-metre peaks. A lot of 6,000-metre peaks there as well, prayer flags everywhere and going, wow, how good is this? The other highlight that really stands out is we met this lovely gentleman called Karma Rita Sherpa and he'd summited Everest 10 times. His father has summited Everest four times and his son has summited Everest four times so he comes from a very strong gene pool. Now he's one of the Sherpas that lays the ropes for the climbing season, very humble man and was telling us that the Kumbu Icefall is still, is still scary for him every year but he's been able to actually purchase the tea house that we stayed in because he's been doing that kind of work and he's just the most gentle lovely man and not sort of going around blowing his trumpet about it is very quiet achiever that was an amazing experience okay uh now what was the least enjoyable aspect of the trip and why the cold <laughs> seriously the cold I'm, i live in canberra and we have really cold winters here but the cold like it's it's like a cold that you can't like it it's not just ex- external air cold on your skin. You're breathing in really cold air. So once we got up to certain altitudes, a lot of us on the tour started getting what they call the kumbu cough, breathing in really cold air. I am quite subject to getting chest infections when I travel. I think that's because Canberra normally has really clear air. Um, so I was prepared with antibiotics for that. Um, so after the climb to Gokyo Re. I ended up with a chest infection because of the air was so cold, so you're just coughing, coughing, coughing. Um, Helen was the only one in our tour who didn't get any sort of illness. Some people got stomach bugs, some people got the kumbu cough. Helen just cruised it. Did you take anything for the um, uh, the altitude at all? Yeah, we did. We were taking Diamox, which, of course, is notoriously a diuretic. So given the fact that you're drinking litres and litres of water as you do at altitude anyway – plus taking a diuretic, it's, and, and you're above the tree line, it can be quite tricky at times to <laughs> find a, a little pit stop. Uh, and I suppose from a logistic point of view, what happens there? Do you just say, look, head off and I just need a break? Or Well, basically the group of people that you're travelling with are all in the same boat. As, as we all know, it's much easier for men, but women just, you know, go, we're just going to the side and you just, you know, squat behind your backpack or, you know, every now and then you find some rocks. But, yeah, like everyone's in the same boat, so most people are quite accommodating. Now, one final question. What is on your hiking bucket list? And again, again, here you've got open slather. So what's your next next big hike that you want to do? Look, I've always had this thought in my head, I, and I know it sounds a bit crazy, but I'd love to do one of those camel treks out in the central Australia where you can trek across the Simpson Desert. Um, people often think that's a bit of a strange thing to want to do, but having done the Lara Pinta, the um, Outback Australia has got a real timeless appeal in that landscape. I found that was the hardest hike for me to come back from. I found it really quite jarring coming back into society, as they call it, after that. Um, and apart from that, I've sort of been looking at the West Highland Way in Scotland. It's about a 150-kilometre trek, but it also has accommodation along the way, so it's quite easy to, to do solo, and it would be really nice to see some green, I think. Yeah, I must admit, I, I, I'm a bit like you. I, I love the Larapenta Trail. It's a trail I, I do want to do again, mm-hmm. uh, and I think I probably will in, in slightly a different fashion than I did before. I just, just love that central Australian desert. Um, I do actually want to do some United Kingdom hikes, but I, 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 as funny as it sounds, I'm not a, a fan of wet green hikes. Well, I've uh, not really done a wet green hike, so I think because the ones in New Zealand I've done haven't really been that green. They've been more the coastal ones. But I have got 10 days off um, in June and I've been looking at the Lake Waikara Moana trek in, in the south of the North Island of New Zealand because it's a year-round trek. It's not an alpine one. But I'm not quite sure now because given the fact that the fire situation in Australia – I'm more inclined to spend my money local, so I'm looking at what alternatives I've got for 10 days Yeah, it, in, in the local area. I must admit, it, it's uh, it's going to be interesting to see what happens over the next couple of months to see what, what's been impacted and what hasn't. Um, so I think uh, uh, there's some hikes which are quite untouched and others which are severely damaged, and I think we're still finding out what that is. Well, hopefully the six-foot track might be an option up in the Blue Mountains. I haven't done that one before, and it looks like one that is quite – good to do solo because it also has accommodations it's a bit tricky trying to carry a tent 
and all your food by yourself. Well, I'll let you know on that one because I'm, I think my plan is to try and do that in early March. So, ah, good timing, uh, so Tim. I'll see, see how it actually comes out. Perfect. We've been talking to Annie Connor uh, about her uh, recent uh, Everest base camp trip. And as we mentioned at the start of this podcast, it's a, a, a hike that's on many people's bucket lists. Uh, and it sounds like uh, it, it was a, a trip that was well worth doing, particularly with the additional add-on, which really seemed to, to make it – I mean, the trip itself sounded great, but the add-on made it sound like a really yeah. spectacular trip. It was. So thanks very much for talking to us. Pleasure. Thanks, Tim. Okay, so that was a, a good opportunity to find out a bit about the Everest Base Camp track. And I must admit, I, while I've done some tracking in that area, it's never really figured high on my uh, uh, my lists. But I think listening to Annie and doing a bit more research into it, it might be one that we add later down the track on our ever-growing list of hikes that we want to do. Well, she had me until she started to talk about how cold she got. <laughs> I just went, no, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> All right. So, I mean, it was interesting listening to what Annie was saying, and we'll go through a few of those things and just talk about them in a bit more detail. She was saying at the start of the uh, uh, the interview that she didn't think she was uh, interested in going to the world's highest rubbish dump. And certainly Everest Base Camp had that reputation a number of years ago where mountaineers would just leave their excess rubbish there and just keep on going down. Uh, they seem to have solved that issue now, and they do do regular cleanups so you're actually getting something a bit more pristine. And I think the, uh, uh, the tracking organisations and the government have realised that if they want to keep on attracting people, apart from the, the summiters doing Mount Everest, they need to provide a bit more of a cleaner environment. Yeah, I think um, it, it sort of goes hand in hand really, doesn't it? You know, that um, if you're going to allow what people are going to see and enjoy and experience, you're going to allow it to, you know, get messy and horrible, then people will stop going there. So it's sort of a, a little bit obvious, I guess, for us. And I think also the awareness of hikers and adventurers, I think, is is much more than perhaps it used to be in the ethic that's attached to all of that. As Annie said, this was a, uh, a trip with Intrepid uh, Travel um, and they have a good reputation within the industry of offering some good quality hikes. And if you go to uh, the show notes for this episode, episode 140, uh, we'll have the link to this trip uh, on the Intrepid website uh, and that'll have pricing and all the details. I, um, the trip, as she said, was a 19-day trip and a 16-day hike. Um, and rather than just doing... Everest Base Camp and nothing else. Uh, she mentioned that it took in Gokio Lakes. Um, and I think that these sort of trips tend to need that sort of thing to, you know, not just, there's nothing wrong with just doing Everest Base Camp, but it's also nice to sort of extend the trip a bit longer and see some of the countryside a bit further on. So I think that was, uh, it sounded like a, a good option and a good alternative. One of the things that did surprise me in looking up at the trip notes on this trip uh, in Intrepid, they say that you do actually reach uh, an altitude of up to 5,500 metres, which is actually higher than Everest Base Camp itself. Uh, so it's um, um, it's certainly, you know, the trips run in such a way that, that you are uh, acclimatised uh, and, you know, not everyone always succeeds with these sort of trips. Some people just don't cope well with the altitude. Uh, but certainly with, with Annie was saying on her trip, the way it was run, they were looking after everybody really well and everyone managed to get to the base camp quite successfully. Um, the other thing that Annie mentioned about was the uh, the equipment that they used. Uh, and this trip was, like a lot of these trips in this sort of region, um, it was designed that you're carrying a day pack. And in her case and uh, her sister-in-law's case, her packs are only four to four to five kilos um, they were staying in tea houses, so there was no need to carry tents. Uh, and um, really, it was just a matter of carrying what they needed for the day. So um, while you are dealing with a bit of altitude change and it is a it is a physically demanding trip, uh, you're not carrying a lot of weight, weight on these trips at all. The thing that I was interested in was that, um, I mean, she gave a pretty good sense of what the experience was going to be and... Um, 
when she was talking through the gear, um, sometimes we think that, you know, you need quite special gear to go and do some of this, but really you just need to be able to layer up. Um, and she was talking about the, the layering. Um, the only thing though, she, you know, did say, make sure you've got a fantastic pair of gloves. <laughs> um, uh, given that their hands were, were getting quite cold when they got to, um, base camp. So uh, that's probably, I don't know anything about this, but that probably sounds to me like a cumulative thing that, you know, your hands were okay for a period of time and then just couldn't rewarm, I think. But yeah, fantastic pair of gloves is the way to go. And I think that's one of the things that as for us as hikers, unless you are doing a lot of wintertime hiking, you've probably got a pair of mid-weight or lightweight gloves, uh, but having a pair of serious gloves that will take you down to I think she was saying around about minus 10 um, from most people. Uh, and, you know, and she lives in Canberra, as do we. So it's, uh, um, you know, we're used to the cold weather, but that's a, a different degree of cold, particularly when it is over a period of days. Yeah, well, I must admit, even down to, you know, zero or minus one or two, I, I lay a glove. So <laughs> I, ha- I have several gloves on rather than just um, one pair. So minus 10 would be really a challenge for me, I think. The other thing she mentioned was uh, using tracking poles. And I, and, and for me, uh, as I said, downhill is a real issue for me. So I wouldn't be doing this trip without tracking poles. Um, and and you know, if you haven't used them before, it's always worthwhile uh, getting used to them before the trip itself. She also mentioned sleeping bags. Um, and because uh, uh, she wasn't having to carry this, uh, she managed to hire a, a good quality sleeping bag uh, without having to take her own. Um, but that's going to be a personal preference. I mean, sometimes it's nice to get something over there. Sometimes you have your own personal preference about what you want. Uh, and for me, as being a, a taller person, uh, getting long sleeping bags isn't always as easy as it can be sometimes. So um, I often would prefer to take my own sleeping bag just in case. One other thing that I'd like to discuss, and she did mention the issue of getting a sick, um, you know, getting, uh, I think she was saying the kumbu cough, um, probably not unexpected in some respects. You're in very cold environments, um, and if you're not used to that, um, that's going to impact on you. Um, I think being at altitude is certainly going to impact on people. Um, and, you know, and some people do occasionally get um, gastric distress, uh, and these are things that, you know, while they're not expected, there's something that you do need to consider on the hikes. So she talked about taking Dymox, uh, and this is actually an antibiotic which is used uh, by a lot of people who are doing uh, uh, altitude tracks. Uh, we've used it on one of our trips, and whether it was more a placebo effect that we were taking it and thinking, yep, we're fine, we're okay, we didn't have any problems, um, or whether it does have impact, um, really, it doesn't matter too much. Um, you know, if it if it's, <laughs> I think if it, you know, if it if it's if you if, think it works, if you think it works, it often that's the case. Um, but yeah, don't be surprised if you do a an altitude trip uh, to high altitude. Uh, if you go to a travel doctor, uh, they'll talk to you about Dymox and whether you should or shouldn't take it. Um, the other thing I think with um, uh, I'm a, a strong believer in filtering water. Anywhere, it doesn't matter whether it's overseas, uh, through the Himalayas, through the Andes, it really doesn't matter too much. And I think you know, you'll find that you're, it's not unusual for the water to be, to be boiled and have your water bottles filled up at the end of the day. Or if you're topping up during the day, definitely make sure you've got some sort of filtration system with you. Um, you, know, you, you know, you've got lots of people travelling through those areas. Um, and you know, the more people you get in a particular area, the more issues you can have. But, but it's not a, an expectation that it will happen, um, but it's best to be prepared for it and just to, uh, to cover yourself just in case by having a, a filtration unit. Okay, so I hope you've enjoyed that um, review of Everest Base Camp. Um, and as we said, yeah, was, we, we haven't done it, so it was good to get a, a hiker, a keen hiker in who's done this trip uh, just to see what it's like. Uh, and as we said, I think it's one of those things where I wouldn't mind doing it at some point. Yeah, and I think there'll be a lot of people listening that will, you know, were wondering whether or not this was for them. And um, uh, a- absolutely, I think, you know, it's been a great account of what to expect and um, what 
what you'll get to see, which is just, you know, stunning and awesome. In our next episode, which is episode 141, uh, to be released on the 26th of February, uh, we're planning to catch up with Lucy Barnard from Tangles and Tail uh, as she continues her journey from the bottom of South America to the top of North America. And as we catch up with her, uh, Lucy is getting towards the end of her South America component. She still has a little way to go, um, but this will be an opportunity to probably be the last catch up before she actually leaves South America itself. So we're looking forward to that. That's all for me this week. Bye for now. And bye from me.